Hensler. I'm the Associate Director of the Helix Center, and welcome to today's roundtable entitled From Children's, in From Children's Sights to Our Insights, Ethiopian Children's Drawings, Stories, and Inner Lives. But before I introduce today's roundtable participants, I'd like to update you on the activities of the Helix Center. Please visit our revamped website, www.helixcenter.org, expertly revised by our web wizard, Eric O'Hanlon. You can register there for notifications of upcoming events and to participate in our online discussion board. We're very pleased to announce receipt of a Templeton grant uh, for the coming year in support of a series of 14 roundtables to be held over this and the following year entitled Science and the Big Questions, Roundtable Series on the Physical and Spiritual World, the Brain-Mind Connection, and Human Development and Genetics. Our next roundtable is on Saturday, February 22nd, uh, for the biology of mind, although it's on both biology and artificial mind. And uh, John Krakauer, Professor of Neurology and Neuroscience from Johns Hopkins. Gary Marcus, Professor of Psychology at NYU. Ken Miller, Professor of Neuroscience at Columbia. And David Rosenthal, Professor of Philosophy at uh, CUNY, will be discussing this. So on today's, today's program, I'd like to introduce our participants. Sitting in the middle is Theodore Shapiro. He's Professor Emeritus at the Weill Cornell Medical College and a practicing psychoanalyst and adult, child, and adolescent psychiatrist. He is a co-principal investigator on a study of psychodynamic psychotherapy for children and adolescents with anxiety disorders. He has more than 200 scholarly and research publications, is author of seven books, and was editor of the Journal of the American Psychoanalytic Association from 1983 to 1994. He has received the Rado, Brill, Hartman, and Philip Wilson Awards, and is a training supervising analyst at New York Psychoanalytic Society and Institute. To his right is Ellen Handler-Spitz, Honors College Professor of Visual Arts at the University of Maryland, who writes, teaches, teaches, and lectures on the visual, literary, and performing arts and psychology and on the aesthetic lives of children. Her background includes four years as a research candidate at the Columbia University for Psychoanalytic Training and Research. And in 2008, she was the Erickson Scholar at Austin Riggs. She has, in addition, held residential fellowships at the Getty Center in California, the Radcliffe Institute at Harvard, the Clark Institute, the Center for Advanced Study in Behavioral Sciences at Stanford, the <coughs> Camargo Foundation in France, and the Rutgers Center for Children and Childhood Studies. She is a fellow of the New York Institute for the Humanities and the author of many articles, chapters, and books, including Art and Psyche, Image and Insight, Museums of the Mind, Inside Picture Books, The Brightening Glance, Illuminating Childhood, and Freud and Forbidden Knowledge, which she co-edited. She has reviewed children's books for the New York Times and the New Republic and contributes regularly to Art Critical. Her work has been translated into Italian, Japanese, and Serbian, and her most recent research focuses on art as illustration and on children's aesthetic lives. Nathan Shanberg, today's moderator, is the Wallerstein Research Fellow in Psychoanalysis of the San Francisco Center for Psychoanalysis on the faculty here at New York Psychoanalytic and formerly Freud Professor of Psychoanalysis at the Hebrew University. He's the author or editor of four books and one novella, Educating the Emotions on Bruno Bettelheim's Ideas, Lives Across Time with Henry Massey, Reluctant Warriors, The Maturation and Inner Lives of Elite Israeli Soldiers, and Sheba and Solomon's Return, Ethiopian Children in Israel, the foundational study for today's roundtable. He studied at the University of Chicago, both undergraduate and medical school, where his teachers included Bruno Bettelheim and Saul Bellow. He graduated from the St. Louis Psychoanalytic Institute and is training analyst of the Israeli Psychoanalytic Society and IPA. Nathan. Thank you. Um, first, thank you to Helix, Rob, and Ed for arranging this. Uh, when I was asked to do this, can you all hear? They put the mic on me. So, um, One of the attractions was to have Ted and Ellen be involved so that I could hear from them, too. So this is, I've been looking forward to this for some time. Uh, the beginning of this project uh, came from uh, when I was working on Sheba and Solomon's Return, which was a study, a three-year study of six-year-old children, Ethiopian children, and their families in a small town near Gaza in Israel. While I was uh, at the Hebrew University, I would drive down twice a week 
to work and play um, and do research there. Um, and uh, the book is a description of what I learned about the children's inner lives, nature of their attachment ties, their parents' attachment ties, and their parents' backgrounds. To give you a sense of the population, all of the mothers and fathers were born in rural subsistence agricultural villages in Ethiopia. Um, in a pre-literate society, uh, very few of the parents, well, almost none of the mothers went to school, and a few of the fathers were sent to two or three grades of school, but that was a big sacrifice for them to do. Um, and most of the kids, the parents I'm speaking of, were doing some sort of uh, economically meaningful activity by the age of eight. So the boys were, had their own um, goats or sheep, the, they were shepherds, or one boy's job was to be both a shepherd and to keep the hamadryas baboons out of his house because they would raid for food. Um, and the girls would help out uh, with the mother uh, in cooking. And uh, most of the fathers were involved in growing fava beans, little plots of land with a cow, um, uh, in, in a very lovely sort of uh, setting, small trees and a river nearby. Um, many of the villages they came from were half Jewish, half not Jewish, or all Jewish. Um, uh, only one of the 46 mothers came from Addis Ababa, that is from a major city. And all of these Jews were moved, uh, I won't describe the details, but in a rather heroic um, uh, evacuation during the turmoil in Ethiopia when I think 1.3 million people were killed by the Ethiopians. Uh, they were bought from the Ethiopians by the Israeli government and I met the daughter of the ambassador uh, to, in Ethiopia at the time from Israel who did the deal and what the generals wanted for the Jews was guns and he said, well I can't get you guns. They said, okay money. He said, fine, so how much? And they said, so many million. Works about $12,000 a person. He said, yes. And then he called his government and said, I need so many million. They said, we don't have it. They said, call the American Jews. So, so he got the money from some New York uh, donors. And in a 72-hour window, uh, cargo planes, which were completely emptied out, um, were flown in and flown out. And the, the reason for the 72-hour window, as some of you may know, is that the Ethiopian government didn't want the Arab countries to know that they were exporting Jews to Israel. So it had to be done secretly and in that period of time. So the population that I lived and worked with, most of them were from that emigration in 91. However, a, a new immigration, um, or of the Falash Mura. Of the Falash Jews are those who are the Ethiopian Jewish Jews. The Falash Mura were forced, converted to Christianity under threat of death in the 1890s by the then uh, emperor of Ethiopia. And they, did, they called themselves a penumbra, uh, a penumbra uh, population because they lived in the shadow of the Christian community and in the shadow of the Jewish community and felt didn't belong to either. It'd be hard to marry off your daughter because the Christians thought you weren't really Christian and the Jews thought you aren't really Jewish. So there was this sort of shadow equality to this community and they're currently coming and that was a new immigration into my town where I was working and that population actually looks quite different. I can describe that if we have time. But the fundamental question for today was when I'm meeting with kids, I spent three years with them and I was in this uh, special uh, after school program that was funded by the Wiesel family. Uh, most of the kids were within walking distance of home so I would walk home with them, spend time in the playground. All the kids invited me to their home so I could do formal assessments in the home and do attachment interviews and so on. Um, the question is how do you, how does one learn from a kid? What, what do you think? What do you feel? What are you like? Who are you? If those are our questions. Tell me about yourself it would be the short version if we spoke with an adult perhaps. So for those of us with, who work with children we learn other ways to ask that question. Usually not asking that question but watching them play or playing with them, watching them play on the playground with other sibs, friends, sibs, and so on, or uh, playing with them, or asking to draw pictures. And there we have, and I think both Ted and Ellen will talk about this, 
a limit developmentally. I mean, I have a limit because I just can't draw very well, but these kids, you know, if you ask a four-year-old to draw a picture, or a four-and-a-half, or a five-year-old, or a six- or seven-year-old, you have different developmental capacities, and there are apparently gender differences in capacities, so that the acute angle that you need to draw an A, or a V, or a W, according to Gazelle, girls learn that sooner than boys in classroom. So there are variations on that. Um, but once the child draws something, one can look at it, but how does one learn as much as one can about what's in the picture? And that's the second part, which is to ask a child, tell me a story about the picture, and to put down exactly what the child does. So that's what I did, and I'll show you a few examples of this, and I use these pictures. There are other ways I use to assess the children, including on attachment or academic performance using um, the child behavior checklist. There are many other ways that I won't you, uh, approach here that are in the book. But I use these to design a Likert-type instrument to compare emotional life and a brief look at their developmental capacity uh, from their picture drawing and their stories. So I'll give you some examples. I have about 300 pictures of the 40, from the 46 children. I picked a few uh, to show you, and I think I'll just show you that, tell you some of the stories, and then I'd like to hand it over to Ted and to Alan to talk about the question of how do we learn about inner lives? What's the nature of visual representation? What's the nature of narrative representation? Uh, the both. So here's an example. I'm going to show you first three pictures. In the book, I had to limit the number of pictures significantly. But here, I'll show you three pictures from the same child, one of our healthiest kids. And she draws a picture. And as in the original, the kids could pick colors. She did hers in pencil. Um, and uh, she calls this girl Ruti. She says she's going to a dancing party. She's finished with the party, had a great time, and wanted to go next week. She has a job. She's a piano and music teacher. Five days a week, she's a teacher, and then she's at a party, if she'll be invited by the headmaster in her office. She's 18 years old, has blonde hair and a pony haircut. Now, in Israel, pony haircut is bangs, I found out. The haircut covers her eyebrows, and she has blue eyes. And I asked her at some point, I said, blue eyes? She says, stop, she's wearing colored lenses. <laughs> so it's, you, you hear, you have both the picture, the, if you just read the narrative, but the, I tried to read it the way she told the story, with that tone. The next picture, it's a, all children are six years old. I'm sorry. And there, some are six and a half, and there are some are six. None are younger than six. Okay. There is one who's seven, for instance, but the, all the kids are six years old. So I'm asking, this is what's called the house tree person. I ask to draw a person. She draws Ruti, then she draws. I say, draw, now draw a boy. And she says, this is Ruti's headmaster. He's also 18. Everything is similar to Ruti. Blue eyes, white skin, and so does Ruti. His name is Gil. His job is to be a headmaster in a high school and he invites Ruti to be a teacher and come to party as well. He's her friend and they like each other a lot. And he likes dancing too. Ruti teaches him piano music, she is talented, and he looks like Ruti's brother. And Ruti loves her three-year-old baby brother. Gil is the prime minister's son. And he puts glass lenses, colored uh, lenses, so that he'll have blue eyes. Ruti is his aunt, no, his cousin. They met at kindergarten up to fourth grade and were in high school together, and they would very much like to be together in 11th grade. And then one more picture from this girl, just to give you a sense of the arc uh, of what happens with stories with one child. I can't do this for all the children, but it gives you a sense. I say, draw a picture of a family doing something, kinetic family drawing. And she tells, she draws this, very detailed, very careful. And then um, she tells the following story, which I'll read through a little more quickly than I should. A bi yes. A baby in bed, a mother and a girl. The baby is eight months, and the family, everybody has blue eyes. And the daughter, Dina, always goes to parties because she's a dancing teacher. Dina has blonde hair with orange stripes and a pony haircut. And I ask, orange stripes? She says she dyes it on each side. 
They both have heart-shaped earrings and the mother has the same hair color and they have round earrings like adults have. Their house is a palace. Now I ask, uh, the word she uses in Hebrew is palace. I said, tell me what a palace is. And she explained, it's any house with a separate entrance and steps going inside. Um, all these kids live in looks like Soviet style apartment buildings with peeling stucco, just to give you a sense. This is imagination you're hearing. Um, and almost every one of the kids, would, what we would be, what we would consider, and even in Israel was considered impoverished. I had one family that was what we would consider upper working class. So these were quite poor families. They work in the factory, mom and dad. They have the same job. They get a lot of money. When the parents are always working, the kids feel all right. They have brown eyes, the parents. The real color of their eyes is blue. The baby has blonde hair like his father, and the mother is, the baby is mother's. When the baby's asleep, he gets a pacifier and a doll, and the mother returns, she gives him a turna, a baby bottle. Later, he goes back to the doll and sleeps with it, and he doesn't go to the daycare in the morning because mother has prepared him a surprise. You have to keep quiet so he doesn't wake up. He can fall from his playpen and hit his head. That can be prevented with a playpen that has a fence. And the family bought the baby pen with a fence that can go up and down. End of story. Let me turn to an extreme uh, in the other end of a child that we thought was quite troubled. Uh, and I'll just show you one picture and one story. Here's his picture, same age. And his first picture looks like it, and he describes it as a girl. This is a boy, his first picture is a girl. Uh, and the story is this. It's raining, and then comes the sun, and then she, the girl, needs to bring her coat. She goes for a trip. She wants to still be on the trip because she has no home. Kids broke into her home with fire. It's better for her on the trip because she has no home. She's alone on the trip. Other children have homes to go back to, and she doesn't. So she doesn't feel good. She wanted to burn down her house, too. She did it because she wanted to go on a trip for a long time. No, she did it by mistake. She can't go inside the house because it burned down. She made her own colors in her hair because she wanted long hair. It's a real girl. Her name is Hannah. I know her. She's having fun. Now, just. This is a child we, on our scale. We rated the first girl someplace close to five, a very high score. And this boy would be closer to one and a half, a child who we thought needed imminent treatment. Could you go back, just go back to the previous one for a minute? Yes. Just one second. Just to, uh, just to do you mind, ju just to see the difference in the way that these children draw the figure. Yes. I want everyone to notice that, that the high functioning child draws the figure very differently. How many people in these children's daily life actually have blonde hair and blue eyes? None a, that a, I can a percentage. Think of a percentage. No, none. Okay. Zero. Okay. So that's very interesting. It's Israel. It's right. That, I want to make that. I'd like everyone to be aware of that. That's a very important thing. This child is focusing on the blonde hair and the blue eyes, although the child has no actual experience of seeing people who look that way. So I think it's important to notice that. Although one of my students from the university pointed out that I have the closest link to blue eyes that they've seen there. Do they have access to the larger culture, though? Absolutely. So they know they, they're comparing themselves. This is an idealized. Yes, okay. absolutely. And one of the fathers complained to me that he doesn't raise his children Israel culture raises his children. Okay. Uh, just a parenthetically, for those of you who may not know, uh, testimony during Brown versus the Board of Education from Kenneth Clark, a psychologist, uh, uh, bore witness to the fact that black little girls preferred white baby dolls to black, showing that separate but equal is not equal. So it is an interesting historical uh, counterpart to uh, uh, idealizing the other rather than. It's very important to notice that the child is so young. This child is six years old, and this is nothing that this is nothing that was told to her by her parents. It was, was nothing that anybody.
tried to teach her, but it's something that she learned so profoundly that it's in her spontaneous story. Okay, sorry for the interruption. You were getting at the difference in the form of the uh, figures, weren't you? Yes. The drawing is very different. The, the figure here is, is, is highly articulated, and the proportions of the figure are different, and the child is making an effort to give you some sense of the costume. Maybe, Nathan, could you show the second one? Sure. The, the family. Can I bring your mic up for one sec? We're having some problems with feedback. You want this one with the family? Yes, I think that's because I think that it's very um, important to see how, how carefully the child has made an effort to draw these, these figures with necks, with, with arms, with hands, with belts, distinguishing the different sex, sex, sections of the body, um, and the sizes of the figures are articulated. And now if we go to the next child's drawing, same age. It's very primitive. Let me show you the next one mm. to show you, to give you a sense of that. I mean, one of the things that. Sir, may I ask a question? Sure. Well, it, we, I, I think it's better that we hold the questions from the audience. Okay, we, but don't forget your question. Don't yeah. forget your question. <laughs> but a, a way to begin to address what Ellen and I think Ted are pointing out, and Ted will talk more about it, I hope, is to, I used as a rough measure of looking at the form of the child gazelle's score for the human figure. Those are rough measures. Here's a six-year-old boy drawing persons. And you Is see, primitive? yes. I'll tell you the story in a moment, but just looking at it, Alan, this is even more primitive than the previous. This is actually, this is very interesting, what you show here, because we know it's fascinating. We know that cross-culturally, the first image that a child, if you give the child the problem, draw a person, what happens is this, it's one um, closed form, which represents some kind of confluence of head and body. The head is not distinguished from the body. It's one oval or circle or shape, inside of which we find two eyes, sometimes a mouth, but usually eyes more than mouth. And the limbs protrude from that one shape. And the child will draw legs first. Only later will the child draw arms. But, so the most primitive, earliest representation of the human form is this shape. And what's so incredibly fascinating is that the very child who draws this is the same child who, if you say to that child, what is this? The child will say ear. If you say, what is this? The child will say nose. The child has the cognitive capacity to name all the parts of the body, or many, but when the child draws, the child will draw this. So we'll get into that later. I don't want to interrupt your presentation. No, this is In fine. a few minutes, I'll show you the sequence, uh, how that happens, and so forth. Uh, these, these little primitive head feet things, some people call them tadpoles. Uh, the Germans call them fuschkopfchens. <laughs> little, little footed heads. <laughs> but just so, I, you know, I can tell you the story. It's written up there. But just to so you know, that picture has um, one girl or two possibly, and the rest are all boys. The boys have all legs, no arms. <clears throat> the girl who has the crown around her, do you see her? Has arms. And the story about this, there's one other girl that's two persons over to the right. You see that with a little bit of a crown around her? So the only one figures with arms in there are women, girls, and all the boys. You know, and the story he tells, so just the pictures alone we can read something from, but then listen to this boy's story. And as you know, those of you who work with children know, this is like a snapshot of the final product. If you watch the actual drawing of it and get a videotape, you see he's telling this story and he's drawing and drawing and drawing as he's doing it. And he says, this is a monster chasing him, that one with the girl with the arms. 
It's a kid, a girl, but she's a monster, a bad monster. She wants to devour someone. She eats boys and girls too. These are the roots of the monster, the stuff around the hair, the head. She has big teeth. She's angry because she hasn't eaten anything. And I asked, what happened to the boy? Because he's going to draw a boy. Oh, he ran. And then a good monster came and drove her, the bad monster, away. Later, another kid came. And then another kid. And then ran away. Another kid. Another kid keeps going. He's pulling on his tongue. He's licking his hand. And he stops answering my questions. And he's drawing pictures. Later, at the very bottom, um, a big kid came and spooked the monster and she ran away. He's 27. He has courage. And later they carry him upwards. He licks his hand and he draws a lot of kids carrying the big kid because he killed the monster. That's his draw person story. I'm thinking maybe I could just, I prefer to pause here and then um, and hear Ted and Ellen take it from here. Is that okay with you? If I Sure, why don't you go to my yeah. uh, thing. Uh, I just want to uh, tell you a bit about some studies that I did earlier on which have the developmental implications that we're talking about. Uh, Nathan already mentioned the fact that we um, can you find me? Okay, uh, that we use drawings with children because sometimes it's easier to talk to them that way and you can talk about the drawings. We, we dare not take the drawings for being all there is because we want the inquiry about the drawings. We can tell from the form some things, but we can't tell what the content means. It's a little bit like Freud's idea about dreams having manifest content and uh, then latent content. So you dare not use the drawing itself as the end all it can tell you is something about the developmental process and uh, what they're uh, uh, pulling it from. Okay, go to the first one. Okay, so we, we use all these techniques to, to get around talking directly to kids. And this is the sequence that uh, Ellen was talking about. Upper top is eyes in a circle, then f the little footed heads, and then as you can see, the arms even come off from the head, and it's only later that maybe something else goes on. Now, what can we say about that from the standpoint of why is this the case? Why, if this is a projection, and people suggest that the most important part of uh, the, uh, the head of, uh, for an infant is the mouth, why aren't the mouths there first? First of all, we, don't, we, don't, we didn't know. I then did a study. Next, next uh, uh, slide which derive from the good enough scoring method. The good enough scoring method says that by three years of age, you ought to be able, any of you, anybody psychologists here uh, uh, can know, if you count, give a child 36 months and you count the number of features that it has, you can add them all up and what, three months for each uh, 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 item and then you add them up and you put them over their chronological age, you get a rough estimate of IQ from this. So it does have developmental salience. It, 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 and it works up until about 12 years of age. You can get an approximation just from the form. Uh, you don't have to trust it, but it correlates usually with something else. Next one, please. Now, along the way, I, and we do these little other figures that they're supposed to be able to do from two to seven. I then had a youngster who came from a very a Hasidic family. He was, he was somewhat challenged intellectually and so forth. And I asked him to do a figure drawing. I wish I had the original there. And he did the figure drawing, which suggested that his mental age was not very good. But notice what's on his head. So now how does that fit into the developmental sequence? And we have to add to all of the developmental propensities that salience in regard to the culture and what's there is also going to be added according to how much exposure they have, which would be interestingly related to some of the things that he's telling you about this. I actually did a systematic study to see if indeed young children drew eyes and not mouths. And sure enough, uh, it seemed to be true. And we had good st statistical findings. Go on. Uh, don't bother. The, the, these are just the files. Okay. Okay. Now, 
Why eyes and a head from a biological vantage point? What is going on here? One of the things that Spitz showed us is developmentally at six weeks, you get what they call a social smile. All you need to get a social smile is a full face and movement. You can pare that down by putting eyes on a balloon together and movement and you'll get the social smile. You mix those eyes up in different places. So what we have is a biological readiness for face recognition and social relatedness, which has uh, always struck me as being a wonderful common uh, uh, factor in regard to three-year-olds. So three-year-olds are not projecting themselves. They're projecting the image of the other, if you will, at that moment. And it's only later that you begin to get the projective ideas that are, are, are being talked about here. Curiously, on a biological level, the representations are, uh, there are two areas of the brain which light up with face recognition. By the way, human beings are face experts. By the way, cross-racially, we're not very good because we don't have enough experience with it. But within racial groups, you know, that comes to the, the notion that people say, well, people of other races all look alike to them. That's not prejudice. It may indeed be something that is going on. Uh, that we, so we're face experts. There's an area in the base of the brain called the fusiform area where this expertise is uh, registered even at a biological level. With that, if you don't look at the eyes and the face, as autistic children, for example, do not, they tend to look elsewhere, you realize this area is no longer used in the modular way that it was meant to for faces, for face recognition. If you get one of these kids who has obsessions, as he, the, one of these, uh, uh, Ari Klin at uh, Yale did, he studied a child who had a Pokemon craze. When he put Pokemon figures up there, that area lit up in the brain. So whatever, if you're a, if you're a car nut, that's the area you're going to light up. Uh, so these are expertise differential areas that the brain subsumes in regard to this. Now on top of this, we have all kinds of cultural issues, of course, once the child grows further. And we talked about the... Uh, 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 the Clark study for the Brown versus uh, uh, the, the uh, Board of Education. Go on, next one, please. <clears throat> now, here's another area where salience becomes terribly important. Uh, this comes from a study that I did many years ago when I was at Bellevue, NYU. Uh, I was asking an autistic boy who was probably eight years of age at that point to copy a square. He copied and he put those things and then he does these. The fact is in his day-to-day -day activity he was obsessed by wheels and spinning. Next one. As he developed, he then incorporated into his human figure drawings, those are arms, those are legs, in the same way. So he didn't lose it. He kept it going because for him, that was the essence of what he wanted to uh, uh, portray, even in incorporating it into his new figure drawings. Next one. That's very creative. Oh, oh, there's a creative process that goes in. It's a kind of integration which goes on always. Here it is again. Now he's a little more mature. Those look like pretty good stick figures, and there's these uh, circles. But notice the circles at the top very much mimic what we saw before. At his at the, during the next year when his maturation was at his best and his language was beginning to get better. Next slide. This is what I got. Now these are pretty dynamic drawings if you look at it. This kid's, this, he's doing a wheelie on his uh, motorcycle and so forth. All right, I just want to bring these to your attention that even though kids may be developmentally disabled or what have you, their capacity to represent themselves or others is a uniquely human situation, but gets curtailed and modulated by the experiences that the child is capable of having because of some biological disability or because of some social disability. People who studied figure drawings across nations and across cultures, if you don't have access to drawing materials, figure drawings are not a good thing to use. 
because they, it, it isn't trained into uh, the, their uh, doing. In fact, what ma many parents do who have disordered kids and they realize they, they're doing developmental testing on them, so forth, they train them up to the task, just like kids do SAT uh, uh, studies and so forth, and so, which is unfortunate because that's not what this is all about. I just want to just highlight the idea of, of form versus function and salience in regard to content analysis in terms of what the meanings of these things may be. And here the meaning doesn't have a kind of psychodynamic, but much more a developmental uh, uh, persistence, perseverativeness from early on, which still exists. May I just add that there's so much pleasure in this drawing. There's, you can imagine the child enjoying making that. Okay. And that's, I mean, the functions lux lust is so great in the drawing. So that's another element I think we have to factor in. As we go on, I will show you some other stuff that I got from a use of drawings. Uh, two studies. One was single consultation using what Win Winnicott called the squiggle game when you have nonverbal children and how complex it could get in regard to intrapsychic variables. And then later on, uh, another study that we did, uh, a great traumatologist, Bob Pinus, was a resident at uh, uh, Bellevue at, at, at Cornell at the time. And we did a study of, uh, we learned that children of suicidal patients in the hospital were not really ever told the facts about their parent suicide for fear of exposure, but the kids knew it. And I want to show you some drawings from that. So I just want to keep that in abeyance. Okay. Oh. Well, um, I, I, I was told that um, we were supposed to be speaking spontaneously and not to prepare um, to prepare a text. Um, so I, I really haven't, but I, I do want to say a couple of things. First of all, in regard to your work, I, first of all, I'm just thrilled to be here in this, on this distinguished panel. And I want to say, for those of you who don't know Dr. Shapiro, he has made major contributions to this field. And if I, I would be a very rich lady if I had a dollar for every time in the past decades, I don't know how many decades, I have recommended his paper on the child age plus or minus seven. What is the exact? Six, six plus or minus. No, seven plus no, or minus seven, one. <laughs> seven, seven plus or minus one, <laughs> age seven plus or minus one. It is, a, if you don't know this paper, it's absolutely marvelous. And I recommend it not just to students, but to teachers, parents, everyone. So I'm very thrilled to be here. Um, I know, just to go back to, to, um, to Nathan's um, presentation. Um, it's very interesting what you did, that you had the child do the drawing, and then you asked the child to tell the story after doing the drawing. And the focus was very much on the story. Now, um, how different is it, we might ask ourselves, for the child to do a drawing herself or himself and tell a story about the drawing that he or she has just made and to tell a story about a drawing that somebody else has made. How is that different from telling a child a story and asking a child to illustrate a story that the child has heard, or to ask a child to tell a story and then do a picture related to the story? Now, those questions that I'm asking, I'm asking them with malice aforethought because I think that after the drawing is made, the drawing stimulates ideas in the child that were not there when the child made the drawing. Therefore, it's, that has to be, it seems to me, a part of the research. It's very different. The, the temporal sequence here is, I think, is important. I also think it's extremely important how the context in which a child draws. Heidegger has a fa very famous paper, Der Ursprung, The Origin of the Work of Art, in which he conceives of the work not as a drawing, but as the work of the drawing, the process of the drawing. 
And I myself, in my work, am very interested in that, in the process by which the child draws. If you give a child drawing implements, and you know in Darfur, when there were all of the horrible genocide going on in Darfur, the human rights workers were interviewing the parents. The children were there. And just to keep the children busy and quiet, the friend, some of the French workers gave the children some drawing materials. The children began to draw. But they weren't told to do a drawing. They just drew. The drawings are stunning because the children drew the atrocities that were going on. Uninhibited, uninhibitedly, they drew blood and death. And they even developed an iconography for it. So when you had a human being turned upside down, that was a dead person in the iconography that these children spontaneously evolved. But the children did the drawings without being told to do anything. We saw guns. We saw. I gave a lecture on this at the Spiritus Institute in Chicago shortly after this. I got, I got hold of those drawings. If you tell children, um, draw, draw a boy or draw a girl, draw a human being, you are giving a task to the child. And part of what the child will, will do, I think, is to want to please the adult. In the same way that we have this problem with every kind of questionnaire that's given, where the person answering wants to please or do something appropriate or something acceptable. But I think that's very different from the child who gets a, something. And then we want to ask why. When you give a child drawing materials and the child starts to draw, why? is the child drawing? What is the impetus for that? So in the literature, there are two schools of thought about that. The schools of thought are matching and marking. So you have scholars who say there's just a desire to make a mark. You know, kill her, I was here. You know, you make your mark. And then there's a school of thought that the idea is to represent something, draw something that looks like something, that represents something, as we see, for example, in Lascaux, in the cave paintings. And there's a division about which of these impulses is primary. In the psychoanalytic literature, there's a brilliant paper by Ernst Kriss, who is a great, uh, not only a great psychoanalytic writer, but he was an art historian at the Kunsthistorisches Museum in Vienna. He has this amazing paper. It's not in his book psychoanalytic explorations in art. It's not. It's in the, in the psychoanalytic study of the child, I think. And in this paper, he describes a, a little boy at the easel. I think it's a, it's a boy, I think, but it doesn't make, it could make it's absolutely no difference. It could be a girl just as easily. And sh the child is taking paint and brush and making wonderful uh, marks. And just the pleasure of putting the paint on this paper is the impetus impetus, and Chris describes it. And then, at a certain point, the child looks at what's there. And the child takes a color and puts something on the page in response to what is actually there. And in that moment, Chris suggests, this is the moment when art is born. This is the moment where you begin to have an artist because the artist isn't just enjoying the smearing and the fun of the materials. The artist is actually making what we're using ego functions of judgment and, and developing skill to try to make something that pleases him cognitively, intellectually, aesthetically. So I don't think we have to choose. But when we think about children's drawings, I think we may want to ask ourselves about this, these questions of marking and matching. The second point I want to make, which is another big, uh, huge uh, conflict in the literature on children's drawings, is the question which really um, bears on the, these two, both of your presentations. The presentation um, that you gave, Nathan, where we see these children who are exiled children coming to Israel from Ethiopia in a new land um, with all kinds of problems of immigration and so on. 
attachment, which is then the, the, the perspective that you brought. Um, may I call you Ted? Um, um, so, um, so, uh, where you talked about the scientific, the universal kinds of issues. So there are certain scholars who say the children, children will draw because this is how it is. This is this sort of this is the biological necessity to do certain things. Other people will say absolutely not. The children are drawing. It's, it's profoundly conditioned by the cultural context in which the child draws. And, you, and I see these um, um, two perspectives as there's a lot of sort of fighting in the literature about this, but I don't think we have to fight about it. I think we can simply see that it's a huge mistake to just take talk about what's lighting up in the brain without understanding the culture. Ellen, I have, I have a parallel comment about that that may be related to. You know, that human beings, whatever culture they are, whatever language is spoken, speak a language and fairly competently by three years of age is a human issue. Whether you speak English or German depends on what your mother talk, yeah. spoke to you. So yes. you, you, that's a parallel notion. Absolutely. Right. Okay. Yes. The capacity to do it is one thing. What you do and what yes. its content that's is. Very is that's very helpful. But, but, it, but it also doesn't solve, but it also doesn't solve the, a, a third issue, which is the issue of what, what is it, why is it that the child takes so much longer to draw what the child can articulate, describe, and say. And the, once again, there's a, there are a lot of theories about this. Arnheim, Rudolf, the great Rudolf Arnheim has a theory about this. But we know that every child by three can name every toe and every finger and so on. But the child will not draw that. Uh, I think that's probably a matter of maturation and uh, biological integration. Uh, that, in fact, one of the questions that comes up, I, I showed you, the, the head end of the organism is highly uh, put together in the beginning of life. And development goes from the head down, cephalocaudate. And you do, the child doesn't even appreciate two stimuli. For example, if you touch a hand in the face, they won't appreciate the hand until they're uh, pushing towards uh, uh, six. So, so all of these are newly integrated aspects of it. They don't represent the middle of the body, you notice, but they, they represent the hands and the toes, which is just the way the brain is organized. If you look at the sensory strip, the thumb has a huge area of, the, of that brain compared to what the middle of the body. If you use something as simple as two-point discrimination on your finger, you can get it a millimeter away, you'll get two points. You do it on your back, you can get three inches and they won't feel two points. So there is a, a maturational aspect of this, I think, which is involved in control of the pencil to do the thing which is different from how wonderful the language apparatus is. Remember, the first year is nonverbal. Infancy means without speech. And then all of a sudden, between one year and three years of age, you become a one-word person to a well-articulated, seven-word sentence, phrase, representational stuff. So the, the language apparatus is much more maturationally available to you than the representational thing. By the way, the only people who, the only creatures on Earth who not only speak and think in language of that sort, but also write and represent themselves. So that, that's. You know, I also think. I also think that there's a brilliant kind of sim symbolism in these early drawings, that they are somehow, um, the, the, they, the child shows what's important in a way that, you know, Picasso famously said, you know, it's, it, you know, it's taken me years to learn to draw like a child. There's a certain way in which the child gets down when the child is left, to do it, and not, what did you say? You used a wonderful phrase, trained up, trained up for it. When the child isn't trained up for it, but when the child is left, the child has a way of getting down in the simplest way what really matters. 
That drawing was amazing, that drawing with the, this, the scooter bicycle thing. So, um, yeah, so I think, that's, I think that's, that's also a part of it, that there's a certain um, beautiful simplicity with all the little details that we learn sort of shunted aside because they're not what matters. I wanted to, uh, Helen, as you were talking, there was, uh, I was looking for one example that I don't have here, but uh, you mentioned how as a child is drawing, things happen, change, and influences what happens next. So I, I wanted to give you an, one example of that. I, the one I wanted wasn't here, but I'll find it is, again, in asking a child to do a Haas Street person, kinetic family drawing, we get to see picture, picture, picture. So here, for instance, is one girl, happens to be seven. So she does a person. We know she can draw a person. It's not maybe very clear, but there's a stick person with a fancy head. Then another person next to it. We sh she can draw another person. She can draw a tree. She can draw a house. And then I ask her to draw a picture of a family doing something, and she does that thing up there on the right-hand side. Do you see it? Yeah. So, and very careful and detailed. And I said, tell me about this. And she says, um, the two light purple balls, which are at 6 and 9 o'clock, and, uh, uh, and there are two dark purple balls at 12 and 3 o'clock. I think you can see the colors and differences. And then she says, the vertical yellow line connects the light and dark balls, that's the 12 and 6, and then there's this line drawing horizontally between 3 and 9 o'clock. She's going through this very carefully. And then she explains that these lines keep the balls apart because if they get too close, they explode. So here you have something else that's crept into. This girl can draw figures, and this is her kinetic family drawing, and the answer is, this is her kinetic family drawing. Uh, family therapists talk about triangular and families. <laughs> this is a drawing of it. <laughs> But another more profound example was a boy who drew very tiny figures, a boy, really tiny in the middle of a big page, only pencil, no color. And then, and then he draws a tiny tree in a tiny house, and then I say, now, and now draw a picture of a family doing something. And he, and he, and he looks, you're, if I'm you, he's looking, he's looking at me during the, and his, the pencil is pointed, poised in the air, and then he goes like this, looking up in the corner over there. And my uh, student from the university is sitting there ready to take notes, and nothing's happening. And I, I ask, do you understand what I mean by a family doing something? And the student says, do you know what a family is? And he goes, and he goes like this. So this boy says something in what he doesn't do. That, that is something about the family for him, let's say, interferes with his, what he can do, which is to draw figures. This is so important. I, that's what I'm interested in. I'm very interested in that. I'm interested in, in that, in the child taking time, not doing something, and also what does the child draw first? So you have a family. Which figure does the child draw first? Does the child draw the father first? Does the child draw himself first? And uh, where are these figures p placed? And which ones are close? Which ones are far away from each other? Um, but I really think it's dangerous, or not dangerous, that's too strong a word, but I think it's maybe irresponsible to put too much, I think you, you said this, Ted, to put too much weight on, any, um, on anything of this kind. It's only useful when it's in the context, in a much larger context. Um, and w what I think we really can't do is to treat a child's drawing as we would treat a complex work of art, you know, a, a, a statue by Bernini or a, a painting by Rembrandt. We, a child's drawing is, um, is something else. It's, um, it's something which is um, spontaneous, it does have psychological content, undu un indubitably it does, but I think that it, um, it needs a great deal of, of, of context uh, before it can be said to have any kind of definitive does, does that make sense to you or does that well, would that's you why one does a study as I did over three years with these families? 
But that's also why you asked them to draw something and then you used it as a vehicle to then probe ideas that you might have asked directly because you know if you ask it directly, you're not going to get the same rich experience that you got or the kind of creative uh, aspects uh, that, that we're talking about. Uh, uh, maybe it's, let me show you two images. Push ahead. <clears throat> uh, more, down further. Further, further, more, more. There we go, okay. Uh, go one more, and then I'll go back to this. because this Okay, this came from the study that I mentioned before of uh, kids whose parents were hospitalized for suicide attempts. Uh, and we used only drawings as a starting point. We didn't ask them about anything. And one of the things we became aware of is that the parents lied to them about what they were doing. Well, everything was perfectly evident, and many of the kids knew, in fact, even knew when the parents were doing. This is a drawing of a youngster who drew his father, who was in the hospital, who had slashed up his neck and his wrists and those are direct representations of his father's bandaged hands and his father's straggly be beard, which was covering up everything else. Now, there the manifest content is smashing in relation to its immediacy. But the further inquiry was to realize that there's more behind this we knew he realized it, we knew it was there, and so forth and so on. No, no matter how many people lied to him, at least we had some evidentiary base that this is his acknowledgement of it. So there the manifest content is useful to us, uh, but it's not, didn't tell us what he was thinking, feeling, and what have you. By the way, one of the outcomes of this uh, study, which was then advanced later on at other places, Bob became a great uh, a uh, student of, uh, of trauma, he, he interviewed a lot of kids whose one parent killed the other right in the police station and, and used these drawing techniques. Uh, I just wanted to use, tell you about how useful it is. Go, go one back now. Okay. So, let me tell you the background of this because I want to get to, to this drawing. Uh, this is a little girl, very shy, very retiring, five years of age, her father, a surgeon, had brought it to see me many years ago. And uh, the family had suffered a loss. A relative of theirs had lost two children and a mother in a fire in a country home. And she knew about it, et cetera, et cetera, and was having, uh, wasn't sleeping very well. Well, her father brought her into the office after I had gotten some history and so forth from them separately. And she was very shy. She was hanging behind her father. She wasn't going to talk, and so forth and so on. I, so I let them both come into the consulting room together. And uh, I realized I wasn't going to get very far with her if I started peppering her with questions or doing anything. I, so I took a stack of paper, and I said, I just read Winnicott. And Winnicott has something called a squiggle game. You make a little squiggle, and they finish it. And then you take another sheet of paper, and then we go further. We must have had 15 squiggles in the midst of it. I was brave enough to ask her father to go out. And he goes out, and she stayed with me, and she loosened up, and she began talking about things. And Winnicott talks about when things become preconscious. At any rate. Along the way, there's a lot of stuff until finally she gets to her being very fond of parties and parties which have this kind of representation, Snoopy parties and so forth. And then her brother, she said, was having a party where there was a fireman theme. So I picked up on that and I said, I heard that there was a sad fire in the family and uh, that uh, uh, there was a sad fire in the family. Okay, she says, yes, I felt so sad that they died. So she spontaneously now tells me without my asking her about it. You know, the sister did get out. So there's some repair in the fact that not everybody went. I look at my daddy's surgery book. Now, where did that come from? So you pay attention to the associative path and so forth as to what's going on. Now, she had made reference to her father being a, uh, 
uh, a surgeon, and he put people to uh, sleep with what she called sleepy air. And by the way, remember, she has a sleep disturbance. Okay. Okay. I looked at my daddy's surgery book and the pictures of them doing dog surgery. My mother and Amy, these are fictitious names, had their appendixes out. Where, where does this come from? You, you sit there amazed as to where, where, where what's, what's happening here? Okay. I said, your mother and Amy? She said, well, they only had to take it out if it's infected. And you cut a hole in a blanket, and then you're asleep. I saw my mother's scar. So here she's going on. I said, maybe you'd like to draw it. That's a picture. OK. And she says to me, what if it comes out looking like a child? I'll leave it up to you as we go along to, to make the inferences, OK? I said, do it as you like to do it. And she draws and says, the oval part of the scar is what I'm going to show. And she has a ponytail, too. I said, you have one, too, because she had a long. She looked at me disdainfully. She said, it's a braid, not a ponytail. <laughs> and then she says, my hair is as long. No, it's longer than my mother's. And then we went on to something else. OK. What has this got to do with the loss of those two kids, her be not being able to go to sleep, her father being a surgeon, and whatever is going on with her about the marvel that while someone sleeps, his father makes holes in their <coughs> body and then juxtaposed to that as a long ponytail to make up for it. Oedipus Schmedipus. <laughs> So ten. So ten. Five. How old is she? Five. So she's to me the 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 most absolutely. By the way, you notice she has the flipper arms of the other uh, uh, child. Very common uh, thing, but she has five it's fingers on it. To me that she that she makes that remark. The appendix. Something is going to come out. Suppose it looks like a child. I mean, that's absolutely stunning. That is stunning, and it's so. It's so real. I mean, children, that's exactly the kind of thing a child would, would think, would say, would imagine. Um, what could come out? We know it comes out of mommies. Oh, my god. And the drawing is it's interesting. You know, what, what, one thing interesting about the drawing when you look at it is that um, you have to remember also aesthetically how do children learn to draw. This is, again, going back to this remark about the culture. Look at the nose. That little um, upside down U is a convention for doing a nose that some children learn by looking at some picture books that have that as a convention. We've all seen that. So certain, certain mannerisms in the drawing, when you're interpreting, if, if you are interpreting it, you, ha you have to remember that children will develop mannerisms um, th that come from the culture. And that is definitely a mannerism. We can't assume that the mother has a nose that looks anything like that. That's a simply a, probably every child, every drawing will that will be the way that the nose. This child will draw the nose. Another child will draw the nose with a flat line or a straight line or a, a U that goes the other way. Um, we have about 15 minutes remaining, so I thought maybe it was time to open up for questions from others. Yes, this lady had a question. <laughs> Is that okay? If anyone else wants to ask questions, line up. All right. The, in the beginning, the blonde child, how do you determine the ability of the person drawing, the child drawing, against his or her creativity? or individuality, then you've got in another picture, the, 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 the artist <laughs> show that the girls with arms and boys without arms. Could this not be imagination running faster than the ability to draw, to get it down? The girls came first, I, I think. 
No? All right, then I'm wrong about it. Let's let, let that go. But one thing that runs through what I have heard today is it seems to me you're making an assumption that drawing ability of all children of the same age ought to be the same or is the same. Not at all. Well, well Not that's at all. In what fact, I'm... I think that's what Ted was laying out here. But I, in fact, if you, I, I didn't take all the time I, I didn't want to take all the time I should, but part of the study in the book is we looked at how very different developmental capacity for drawing was at the same age. That's the advantage, and that's why I chose to look only at six years of age. But go, go ahead, something else you wanted to ask? Or? Yeah, no, just a couple of quick points, because they all are surround the same issue. It's not what I heard, by the way. Um, read the autist, autistic child with, and the bicycle. I don't know how many people in this room could draw that bicycle as stunningly as this autistic. That child has artistic ability. You know, I mean, I certainly couldn't do it. Okay. Um, uh, and then the idea of, well, you went into this, which came first, the drawing or the... Or the um, and so the bike and the, where was the family? Oh, yes. The abstract drawing of, of you, you told her to draw a family, that abstract with the dots and the yellow line and so on. In this case, what I see, and I'm not a professional, but what I see is in the bike, the artist the, or the youngster has extraordinary drawing ability, capacity, even though he's artistic. And as far as the child who did the abstract family, think of the abstract ability of that child far beyond her age, far beyond her age, to be able to contemplate such a representation of her family. Well, anyway, okay, thank that's you. what I want to say. Could I, could I respond to, the first, to, to your first point? Because I'm so glad you made that point. I think that I, I was sort of, when you started, I, was, I knew, I kind of knew where you were going with that because I think it's really important. So you're, you're, what you're suggesting is that that image, which okay. I plead guilty to calling primitive, what could in fact be an amazingly okay. creative expression on the part of a child who could have possibly drawn the figure in, in, other, in, other, in other ways. And I think that's very, very important to keep in mind. And, um, the, 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 the cognitive ability, the ability to draw something is something which you, which you had, is, is trained up. It is something that is trained up. A child is, and is rewarded. The parent will say, oh, wow, you know, when the child does it you know, correctly, like coloring in the lines on the coloring book. These are things that the culture is rewarding. But a child who does it in that magical way, like the, the, the bicycle, or the other way, Th that child might not be rewarded. And it might not be right to call it primitive. It might be right to call it something else. So I really, I appreciate that so much. And I plead guilty and I stand corrected. And I think that was a, it's a wonderful contribution. Thank you. If I may add one thing, I have a granddaughter who's gonna be three, but I la last with her, she was a little over two and a half because they're in San Francisco. Anyway, she loves to draw. She can't draw to save her life. She, I mean, you know, she can't, she just scribbles. But give her stickies, the stick-ons, and she will create a montage with um, an artist sensibility, you know, an equal number of horizontal, uh, followed by an equal number of vertical or a circle, <coughs> and it has form. So anyway, we have about thank you. ten minutes, so to get an idea, so that you all know how many questions there are. Um, perhaps, as Rob has suggested, those who have questions, if you would step up and in line so we know how many people have questions, and you can keep that in mind when you ask your own question. There, there should not be a war between the artists and the humanists here. I mean, this is not that, uh, I, I'm not against creativity. I, I just want to know what aspects of capacity with developmental uh, achievement. There are people who have very different abilities to be sure to be creative. I'll tell you one t point where you hit a lot of tension between those who wish for and, and foster creativity 
and the kids in another camp. If you get six and seven year olds, you send them to art school, everybody wants them to be terrifically creative. You know what a six and seven year old wants? Control of the medium so he can make it work for himself in the way in which he wants to. Also, there's wish. So, there, so there's, a, there's a tension between our encouraging, you know, the artistic and the, yeah, go ahead. Thank you so much for your, uh, for your good uh, work in coming out today. And uh, sometimes I've been a teaching artist, early childhood education. So first of all, you might find it interesting, anybody here that I have a video up on YouTube where five-year-old kindergarten kids from Inwood say, no adults left behind. They sit in their little kindergarten chairs and they ask each other questions about life. What makes you happy, sad? Why do people lie, cheat, and fight? And the five-year-olds spontaneously, no adults in this, have better answers than most adults. So my question is going back to, as Alice Miller, who I greatly admire, she, one of her main ideas was emotion attaches meaning to experience. If there's no emotion, there's no way that anybody can create meaning and understanding out of reading, writing experience. There's got to be an emotion. When it comes to education, emotion is left out like it's the plague. So for a five-year-old, and I'm still like a recovering five-year-old in my own life, it is like, all the emotionality is that what, if my mommy and daddy scream, yell, and fight like some of these things with, from Ethiopia, it must be because I'm a monster. And that's like the emperor's new, you know, the, the, Kids eating up the, the, the pee under the 20 blankets of saying, I am a horrible and my whole life is predicated, I'm a monster. But to use this, because language hasn't evolved yet, but... When it comes to like primary and basic education, institutionalized education, rather than just somebody who has a psychiatric problem, that you have lots of experience, credentials, that these kinds of ideas to help a child emotionally express the feelings that lead to meaning and understanding, but in a way that is connected with the development of the brain that do you see positive things about how these things could be introduced into everyday education in the classroom rather than making a five-year-old be a grown-up adult when he's five? You know, I mean, uh, is it something you're doing, you're taking action on, or, you know, how would that, it, what you're doing, this is why I'll finish up here, complement, you know, the push to get a, a five-year-old to read and write. Okay. Then. I think you have articulated a, a, a wonderful new topic for the Helix Foundation, but we couldn't possibly address it in this. In this it's, a, it's a huge problem in America today, and not just in America, but in China and India and everywhere. It's a huge problem. You're addressing something in, in, enormous, sir. But I'm just saying. Bless you for addressing it, but I don't think we can answer it. No, here. I'm, I'm also motivating you all who have credentials who are greatly admired to maybe take the initiative that you can do something about this and make a difference in the lives of hundreds of millions of children, you can do it. But it takes people like you to take the initiative. And I greatly, you know, in the name of children, you know, I'm, okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Um, another I, have point. I want to just maybe just a, a supplement to this. The program that I worked in, I chose very carefully in Israel. Um, in general, the Ethiopian kids are integrated into all the public school systems, but the public school systems in Israel, the classrooms are 35 to 38 children. I can't even begin to understand how they do that, but the kids learn. They're really smart, and they do well academically. Um, when the Wiesels were asked, when they wanted to do something significant in Israel, and uh, Eli Wiesel used his Nobel Prize money to do this, he specifically set up an after-school program for Ethiopian kids only in two communities, Ashkelon and the one that I was in in Kiryat Malachi. And, uh, and the focus on the program was on academics, reading and writing. These parents who are illiterate or preliterate, it's very important to them that their kids learn to read and write. And to get ahead in Israel, you need to read and write. And the, and the focus on the program really is helping them with their academics. And they do it in a remarkably warm way. The classrooms are... 18 children, or 15 children, or 17 children. Um, and I chose, of all the classrooms, I picked one where I thought there was a teacher who was really very connected with the kids and uh, effective. Um, so the teachers did say, when I asked, I took the kids out 
to draw. I was the picture doctor, they called me, from Jerusalem. Um, they would sometimes be surprised at what the kids revealed. First, they didn't know that was going on in the family, or they might have known, but they didn't know the details. So they were surprised at what the kids could reveal with that. So that can maybe supplement or complement what their work was, but it was clearly important, and I support what they were doing, that the kids should learn their academics, and the kids enjoyed it. Uh, I had the pleasure of writing a uh, blog for Nathan's book. One of the things that hasn't come out today, and you ought to read it, is that most of these families were traumatized and, and whatever they were doing there must have come through in some of these drawings here or there and so forth. Uh, the women were forced into marriage when they were teenagers. The second thing is, is that uh, they were immigrants from a, 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 a culture which was persecuting them and then they were here and they found this uh, a place to, to live and bring up their children. So there's a lot that's not being told about this that you ought to learn somewhere else, but uh, I just want I, th I think three or 17 <coughs> plus or minus two short questions. <laughs> and one has to do with the, I, I really thought your talk was, or your discussion was very stimulating. Um, one had to do with the relationship between the drawings and the writings, um, the stories. The stories seemed to be, as you enunciated them, were very sophisticated. They seemed like they were pretty. They, they weren't in any way illiterate. They were pretty sophisticated. Yeah. So I was curious about the relationship that you perceived having to do with that. And the second question is somewhat related, and it had to do with the extent to which these drawings or stories have a therapeutic value in and of themselves. Right. And third <laughs> is a little bit more, uh, that's a question. Uh. Third is a little more um, of a comment, and I was very impressed, and I am, with the international relation, the global and, and comparative cultural differences that exist. And I think they're pretty significant. Because there are stick drawings that uh, kids in Africa use mm -hmm. because they haven't seen sort of, they can use photographs as well, or you know, three-dimensional, because they haven't seen them. They haven't seen right. airplanes. Well, now they do, maybe. But they're more familiar with cartoon stick drawings. Anyway, those are the two main questions were. Um, the second one I'll start with, uh, the therapeutic quality. And one of the things that comes out in our work, and Ted refers to Winnicott's squiggle game, is that it's hard as a doc to not try to do something that's helpful even if you're just supposed to be diagnosing. you know. Or I was trained in developmental assessment by Sally Province and Sally's uh, you know, emphasis to us is to help the child do the best he or she can. You want to get the best picture the kid can do, not literal drawing. So yes, and, but if I'd come in as a therapist, um, many of the parents would have been skeptical of me. In fact, one of the conditions of my doing the research by the parents, I could see the kids, I could draw, I could tell stories, I could come to their homes, I could do no testing, no IQ, no projective, nothing like that because they were specific about this. They were worried that the Israeli government would get the information and would do something to their kids. So that's a subversive quality. Um, the, the first question is a more complex one as I recall it. And that is, I had over 300 pictures that the kids did in stories, and it varied the nature of the story versus the picture, the richness, the complexity, depending on the kid, and, and so on. Um, and I had kids who would start saying, I don't know how to draw a person. And I'd say, that's OK. Then they drew a person. This stuns me when I see this happen, you know? So. Um, it, it, it's my sort of unsatisfactory answer is it depends when it comes to the relationship between story and drawing. Can I? Um, let me think. I think there are others can answer that. I, I want to think about that. Ellen. I would like to relate this gentleman's question to this gentleman's question because I think those two questions really can be brought together. The second, your second question and your question. I think there is inherent therapeutic value when a child is given a chance to express herself or himself. This is an inherently in a, in, in, a, in a constructive kind of way with drawing materials, with singing, with dancing, with 
writing a poem or with, when a child has those experiences, it is inherently therapeutic. I was a, the um, Erickson Scholar at Austin Riggs in Stockbridge, and one of the most wonderful things that it, in that um, community, um, which is an inpatient uh, cent center, is that there are all kinds of places for patients to do drama, to do artwork, to do all these things. And the person who was really responsible for that was Joan Erickson, who was an art therapist, but who was an art therapist who did not believe in interpreting the content of the drawing, but who believed in something so amazing. She said, let's bring an artist, a practicing artist, a sculptor, for example, in two rigs and give the sculptor a studio and let, let the sculptor work and let patients come in and just be there with the sculptor and talk to him and interact with him and then they can have materials and they can do this work. So your point about what's good in education for kids and your point about is it inherently therapeutic are very easy to bring together. These are activities that we are not giving priority to. And what you said, Nathan, is so true. Parents are so terrified that children won't make it in the world, that they won't be able to make it in this the tough world out there that we have to test them and prepare them and 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 and, and, and you know and give them what 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 we think they should know. And what's really what's really growing the whole person, Jerome Bruner, who is 97, no, 98 years old now, wrote an amazing book called The Process of Education. He believes that the child constructs a world, as did Piaget. And we need to let the child construct the world. And we need also to let the child take risks. We're so ready to step in. Parents today are so ready to step in and not let the child take risks. I just published a, a little paper on creativity in childhood. And it's very important to, I don't believe it not being safe, but I believe that we should let a child figure out something even if it's a little bit risky sometimes, because that's the only way, in not just in art, but in other areas too. So I think those questions do come together. It's 4 o'clock, oh. and Rob said we could run over a bit. Well, oh. we, we go till 4.30. 4.30. Oh, we have time. OK, we have time. Go ahead. Um, um, what I, thanks for an interesting talk. What I found fascinating, what I was thinking about was, in your experience, have you um, worked with kids um, who, you know, when you give them the pencil and paper or the crayon and, pa and paper, you know, if they, you know, draw outside of the boundaries of the paper, you know, I found it fascinating that all the kids respected the medium so much that they stayed within the confines of the paper. And I wonder if the paper was larger or if it was a circle instead of a square or a triangular paper, how much it would influence what they would draw or feel that they could draw. If you say draw a house, but the paper was circular, you know, what would happen? Then, um, you know, I can't recall, I'm a child psychiatrist, but I can't recall giving even a young child pencil and paper or crayons and them drawing outside of the boundaries. And I'm just wondering if you guys had that experience and you know, what do you think that means about that child? Well, can I, I, can, I can tell you I worked at the Idelson Center for Child Research with schizophrenic children. And the little boy that I was, I wrote about this, I wrote an essay about it, but this little boy had no sense of boundaries. He, everything, it went, oh, the paint went over onto the table. It went over onto him. It went into his mouth. It went everywhere. And actually, you know, um, he was so in the material. And, and it was, in a way, I mean, it was, it was OK, because he really needed that. And I think you're, you're getting at something, which is, again, this is the control that we put. Where are the boundaries that we want to give to the child? I mean, I think big is good. I think giving a children a wall or a huge having kids. I've done this you know, with kids, because I've actually done a lot of work with but, you know, giving them paper on the floor and letting them draw something big. I think big is important. Children need that. They need bi the big to draw. Sid, everything's so, it's very constricting to draw small all the time. Big is good, I think.
for many children. Children are afraid of that too. It's good to get them out, move them out of their comfort zone. The comfort zone is to do what the grown-ups want. But sometimes, and the thing is the teacher has to not be afraid. Teachers are the ones who are afraid. The teachers are afraid of the children. The teachers are afraid of what will come out of the child. I wanted to show you, I don't know if there's time, but I wanted to show you the drawings of the children of Terezin, the concentration camp that the Nazis made in, in near Prague. Um, children, the children did, did drawings there. Um, and the teacher was a Bauhaus artist. She was, her name was Friedel Dicker Brandeis. And in the, in the Bauhaus, you know, it was a, it, universal arts, okay. architecture, furniture design, fabric design, drawing, painting, sculpture. Everybody studied there had to try everything and do everything. And she worked with these kids who were separated from their parents, living in separate houses. I don't know how many of you, are all of you familiar with what went on in Terezin? I feel bad because my work, I didn't only brought the, the probably just the ones that everybody knows. But um, should I show them? Should I, should, I, should I? I don't know if I should. Do, are you interested to see them? No, I, I just have a few. I have a few of the drawings, but they're in. We put them onto the. We're going to transfer. How, how about if we do this? Ted wants to show one picture responding oh. to this question of boundaries. Yeah, that and then was we can wonderful. transfer <laughs> over. Uh, <coughs> I wanted to show you this because it may relate to your question. I did a study once of kids' conceptions of ghosts, so I had them draw ghosts. This was the most elaborated ghost I've ever seen. Most of them are very uh, 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 slim and uh, narrow. And so, but this kid, uh, I mean, you know, what do you put down on the page uh, is an overflow of. Uh, it has nothing to do with what a ghost looks like to him because later he drew a ghost for me. It has to do with the feeling aspects of it. So yes, this is the, uh, uh, all of the unarticulated explosive aspects of his anxiety and fear and so forth and so on. So if you want a representation of that. I, I do want to make one comment on education. Uh, you know, there have been, I, I know in a group like this, we're all very touchy-feely. Uh, uh, there have been movements in education which want to teach for the whole child and the creative and the so forth. There's the Dewey movement. There's the, uh, there's the Montessori movement. There's the uh, uh, Rudolf Steiner movement and so forth and so on. What's happened in America is a backlash against that kind of education which started with Sputnik in our competition with the fact that we weren't getting our, our math is not as good as it is in, in, in China. So we have a highly competitive, learn the three R's and then we can go on to who's creative. But not everybody's gonna be creative. So that's, that's, that's an artifact of our culture, not the aims of education. So I just want you to. And then when I, when I listen to Alan, my, my thought is, and your question about boundary, um, I worked in Israel uh, the schools are not very rich. For me to get clean white paper was a big deal. I brought my own finally. I brought my own crayons because it was too, and I, I know how to get crayons that don't break. Or, no, or, no, seriously, you can get this kind of, I learned this from Sally Province, this thickness crayons, they don't break. All sorts of little tricks like that. So um, maybe this would be optimal in certain settings, uh, you know, to have, different shapes, paper, and different sizes. But for me, to have each kid have a ream of clean white paper and crayons that weren't broken was a big deal. And I still have. I, I had several, I, actually, they're drawing pencils um, that they're like this thick. And I sharpened them each time before I saw the kids and so on. And I had a sharpener there in case they broke it. I mean, those are the little practical things. But the other is, I hear Ellen talking about helping a kid express whatever spontaneously is coming to him and, help, and helping that as a process to work it through. Um, that is a, an important part of the process. My job was a different one, which is to ask each child of 46 children, tell me about yourself. Most of my kids also did spontaneous drawings, which I, some of which I include in the book. But in order to compare one child to another, I wanted to make sure that each kid drew the same picture. So I did that. I'm guilty of that, saying, draw a person. By the way, most of the kids enjoyed doing that. Very few objected to it. So your questions are interesting ones, and you could pursue that yourself and see how it comes out. 
Um, in terms of boundaries, my experience, and it may be similar to what Ellen is describing, that it's my more disturbed kids who go outside the boundaries of the paper. Most kids stay inside it. Uh, you could say some of the more disturbed kids are very constricted and stay right in the middle, but really disturbed kids are the ones who went beyond the paper onto the um, table. And none of these kids were that disturbed. You want to go down on your I, I can't make it. I, it's here, like, no. here you go. Other we'll questions while no, Ellen's queuing up her pictures? To the full screen. Okay. Any other questions? I can't get it to the full screen. By the way, there's <laughs> copies of Ellen's book and my book available afterwards for those who want to. <laughs> I can't make it do this. Can I get it to the full screen? No, that, it won't do that. No. I don't know what it's doing. One thing I'm really bad at is technology. Do you want to present something more while mm -hmm. she's setting that up? Yeah, How do you do that? that? She's got it. Oh, she's got it. Okay. Come. She just can't get to the full screen. I just can't. I'm trying to get it to be go full screen. Yeah. Bottom on the right. Maybe that slider or maybe that thing on the Oh, here. Bravo. Brilliant. Thank you, my dear. Thank you so much. Okay, I think we need to have some left. Um, is there any way to get less light? It, or I guess not. Let's go ahead, Ellen, because we'll spend okay? so much time. Oh, okay. Yeah. All right. So um, the, the, Nazis, the Nazis created a concentration camp um, outside of Prague, which had been a fortress, um, which held a relatively small number of people. When the Germans um, began to import, to bring Jews there, they, uh, they took everybody out. They brought huge numbers of Jewish people. Czech Jews there, including a lot of children. It was a place where there were a lot of artists, a lot of writers, musicians, composers. When you go to the archive, you, you, you're astonished by what went on in this camp artistically. But what happened was Friedel Dicker Brandeis, who was a Bauhaus-trained artist, one of the very few women artists in the Bauhaus, was eventually captured with her husband and brought to this camp. When she got to the camp, she decided, separated, of course, from her husband. All the men and women were separated. She decided to devote herself to the children. She lived in one of the girls' houses. The girls in her house were 12 to 14 years old. She decided to teach them, to help them draw, to give them art, because the Nazis had forbidden school. So they couldn't do any formal learning, but they could do music and art. They didn't think that was very important. So of course, the children could, could do that. What did she do for materials? She scrounged materials. So whatever she could find, she used. And this is a child's drawing. The Germans renamed the children. They gave them these Czech names were Germanified. When I looked at these, looking at these drawings, I, I just want to quickly tell you that what happened was she worked with these children for two years. Her husband was going to be deported to Auschwitz. She heard about that. She, without, with some glimmer of hope, decided to try to join him to go to. Both of them were killed in the gas chambers. But when she realized that she was leaving, she took the drawings of the children. We thought originally there were about 2,000 of them. It turns out that there are close to 4,000 of these drawings. She crammed the drawings into two suitcases and hid the suitcases of these drawings, hoping that they would be found. And then she went off to die in Auschwitz. After the war, the suitcases of the drawings were found. These drawings are now in the archive of the Jewish um, museum in Prague. I've spent time there on several occasions looking at the drawings, and they're amazing. And one thing that they tell you, which we didn't talk about today in the round table, um, we didn't mention, is the element of wish. A, a dream, Freud talks stunningly in the interpretation of dreams about how a dream is a wish, can be seen as a wish. And drawings can be wishes, too. And when you look at these drawings by these children, you don't see atrocity. Almost none of the drawings show you the horrible things that were going on around them. What they show you is what the children missed, what the children longed for, what the children didn't have anymore, what they remembered. And sometimes you see what was going on. So here, this is a picture of the barracks, a terrazine. 
by one of the children. This is a drawing by one of the artists in the camp, an adult artist in the camp, um, whose name was Bedrick Fritta. And he did this drawing of one of the deportations. I'm not sure whether the people there are leaving or coming, but this was, and these drawings were done clandestinely, of course. This is a picture of one of the children. And here's another children's drawing. This is the doorway of Terezin. When you go there today, if you visit the camp, you see the um, yellow painted plaster and the wooden door. This is an, another child's drawing. Now, the children in Terezin ranged from eight to about 16. No one was younger than eight. None of the children whose drawings we have were younger than eight. None of them was older than about 16. And when they're documented, when we have documentation, we have the birth of the child and the date of the deportation to Auschwitz, which is the date of the death. Because no child, uh, the child would always die in the year of deportation. So you have those two dates. And you can assume that the drawings were done within two years of the date of deportation. So this is what the inside uh, look like from the child's point of view. This is another child's drawing. You have here the bunk beds. Everything was, uh, was numbered. The, you know the numbers were put on the arms, but the, everything was done according to number. The, 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 this house that um, Frida lived in it was L104. The, the houses were also numbered. The Nazis were very good at dehumanizing people in every possible way, but giving somebody a number is a way of dehumanizing you. Here, we, this is, I, 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 we have no information. No, in, so in my imagination, I see the matron on the right as Friedel herself. She looked a little bit like that, but of course, probably wasn't she. There is, you see the, the suitcases under the bed. Of the, of the children who were in Terezin, 15,000 children passed through this camp from 1942 to 1944. Of the 15,000 children, Jewish children in that camp, 100 children survived. All the rest died. So the drawings are, by most of these drawings, are by the children who died. Now, this is stitchery. The children, she scrounged materials. You can see this is a ledger, some, a page torn out of some ledger. And she got some wool, and you see the child doing flowers, butterflies, all the things that the children wanted, the wishes, but they couldn't, didn't have. So this is the family gathered for the Pesach Seder, which of course the children no longer could experience, but they remembered. I love the bows on the hair, the big bows and the hats. So carefully, lovingly done. And this is one of the most poignant ones, very famous, because of course the children had to leave their pets behind, little Scotty dog. The one survivor that I met, there, there was a children's opera performed, written by the, the, a composer who was in the camp called Burundibar. And I actually wrote about this, and I actually met a, one of the survivors who sang the role of the cat. There were three animals in the opera, a dog, a bird, and a cat. And this um, Ella Weisberger, who sang the role of the cat in the opera, told me, I said, what did you miss most? And she said, I, I missed most. I wish I could say it exactly the way she said, going between children in school, by which she meant being able to sit in school and learn with other children. So here you have the school, and the little child in Terezin is drawing the children coming out of school with their lunch, their lunch boxes. I mean, it's, it, could be, it could be America today. Uh, it's, it's very um, easy to ident It's so easy to go and look at these drawings and identify with this situation that occurred so long ago. Um, another drawing, you see a butterfly here. It's a watercolor. The child is struggling with the medium. Watercolor is notoriously, some of you probably do watercolor, it's a notoriously difficult medium. The child is working with it. And Friedel did all kinds of things. Her teaching was amazing. Um, a couple of survivors wrote about her teaching. I mean, she would sometimes hear, this is a, this is a, this is a terrifying image. It's one of the most terrifying images that have come out. You see 
The child is very frightened. The door is black. And the child is running away from something. It's hard to see what it is. The child is just very, there's just fear. It just seems to be an image of fear. And then this notion of solidarity, holding hands, the children trying to make some kind of solidarity that could protect them. This is one of the few images we have, which shows a guard with a bully stick. And it's very interesting. I don't know if you can see. I don't have my little pointer that I usually use when I'm teaching, my little laser pointer. But if you see that the child gra graphically uses angular lines to do, to do the, the frightening guy. But the sur sort of curving, softer lines to show the other figure with the Jewish star. And the curving lines are the softer ones, the more vulnerable ones. And the angular ones are the lines of the one who's, who has the power and the danger. And you see the, um, the mug and David, the stars of David there, that the children were, of course, forced to wear. And then this very, very um, sort of almost fairy tale like image where you have a princess, a dragon, what looks like in the upper left, can you see like a magician type of figure? And what I think about this is that sometimes Friedel would read stories to the children. And in, in the opposite way from what you did, Nathan, we would read a story, and th then the children would draw while she was reading. Sometimes she gave them still lifes. Sometimes she showed them reproductions of famous artists. We have, you, we, we have, you can see the child trying to do something in imitation of. She did all kinds of things to try to stimulate them. And one of the things that was unique about her was that she, she was a no-nonsense, apparently, woman. She never had children herself. She was not, uh, but she was not afraid of anything that came out of a child. Nothing could frighten her. She would, she would let the child express anything. Ah, and this is a collage. She, we also work with collage. This means, uh, this is a, like a puppet theater the child has done, um, like a little you know, um, Punch and Judy show type thing. And this is a puppet theater, but done with cut paper in a collage. Um, this is a, a drawing by Otto Unger of the composer, Hans Krasche, who did the music for Brundi Bar. And if I should, should I go on and show a few more? Um, so this, the Nazis made a film uh, uh, for the Red Cross to try to, show that, to try to show the world, because they were very worried that the world would find out what was going on. And they made a film called Die Führer schenkt die Juden eine Stadt. Some of you know, I see people nodding. The Führer, Hitler, gives the Jews a city. And what they did was they took people out into the sun. They put rouge on their faces. They tried to make them look OK and photograph them. And then they had the children perform this opera, Brundibar, which is a story of a, of a, a it's like a Hansel and Gretel story two children, a little boy and a little girl, need to get milk for their sick mother. And they don't know what to do. They have no money. But they notice that there's an organ grinder called Burundibar who grinds his organ and makes music. And people throw money into his hat. And they think, ah, we will sing, and people will give us money. But when they sing, their voices are too soft, and nobody hears them. And then. They go, the organ grinder chases them away, and they go and they sleep. You know how Hansel and Gretel has that moment in the, in the middle where the children fall asleep and the angels come, and they have this very, very beautiful music at that point. The children fall asleep, and the little animals come out, the cat, the bird, and the dog, and they say to the children, if you all join together with all the children, your voice will be loud, and people will give you the money for the milk for the mother. So that's what they do. And the children come out on stage, and they sing together. The song that they sing is heartbreaking. It's a song that the words are, when my mother cradled me in the cradle, she never knew how I would grow up, what my life would be like when I grow, grow, would grow up, what I would be when I grew up. And of course, it's heartbreaking, because the children never grew up. And the people start to give money to, the little, to them. And the organ grinder steals the money. And then the people chase the organ grinder. And in the end, the children prevail. And this is the final scene 
of solidarity. You see the little sign Scola, school at the top, and the children are singing together. And this finale of Bundibar was sung over and over again in the camp. Adults sang it, children sang it. It was sort of a, a moment of, and here's the hand-lettered program for it, um, showing that this is what they did. They did these little, and here you can see the set. That's Brindy Bar, the organ grinder. The set designer was called Zelenka, wonderful artist. And again, the, the set. And then I just have this to show you that one of this artist, Fritta, who did that transport picture, had a three-year-old. He died of, of starvation in Auschwitz, but he made a picture book for his child. And it's exquisite, and it, it exists today. So you see Tommy, with his little boy's name, is turning three. He's looking out the window of Terezin. And there he has his birthday cake. He's drawing, he's scribbling, and his father says, will you grow up to be a painter like me? He's praying. And then it says, this, this is the truth, pravda, this is the truth. There are places like this where the sun shines and there's, you can play in the meadow, run around naked and there'll be butterflies and birds. There's really a place like this outside this camp and also, this is also true that you can go buy food. And, and then this is the most heartbreaking thing for us as Americans to see. The last page of the book, I wish you for your birthday in 1944, food, peace, sunshine, and that you should come to the United States of America. Signed, what we would call daddy in check. A difference in the discrepancy between, on the one hand, the creativity that the father shows, on the other hand, uh, the, the, the tragedy that these children were murdered, um, and also discrepancy, as I think I, I'm fortunate to be able to work with kids who aren't getting murdered and who are, in fact, in a new country and are given a very good life that, compared to what they were facing and their parents were facing in Ethiopia. Real difference. The child, this child uh, lived. Mm. The father died, but the child okay. actually did live. Yeah. The child lived. We have, uh, we have to be stopping shortly. For those who are interested, books are available. We'll sign them. Thank you for coming. Thank you.